Good afternoon, everybody. You can sit down already. You can sit down. Those are some good songs, right? <laughs> so, uh, do you guys remember what I was talking about last time? I know that some people are not here. Some people are here. Do you guys kind of remember? No, no, no. David and Goliath. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Well, last time, uh, two weeks ago, 
I told you guys that maybe I was uh, um, um, that we were not gonna be the last week because everybody left to Utah. But today we're gonna end that little area because last time um, I was preaching and uh, I didn't finish uh, finishing up the the chapter. So today I'm gonna conclude the what we were talking about two weeks ago. So so we can continue talking to, uh, a different sermon. But so today I just want to end that little that little area. Um, does everybody have their Bibles, right? Everybody has their Bibles and stuff? Cool. All right. So, let's see. So, we, we left in Samuel, right? Okay. And Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17. Okay, you guys are have it right there. So I believe we left in yeah. We talk about Saul trying to arm David. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start in chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, in verse 36, verse 36. So we're talking about David and Goliath, and we and I remember that we left off where uh, we were talking about how can we overcome our challenges and, and ourselves and stuff. And we were talking about how Goliath came prepared with his armor and everything, but yet David had no armor or nothing, but yet he only had a sling. And he took uh, five stones to to uh, to slay the the giant. So I'm gonna read by chapter. Uh, sorry, chapter uh, chapter 17, verse 38. Um, I, I'm from 37. I'm gonna put 37. Are you guys ready? Okay. And David said. Moreover, the Lord that delivered me unto the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord, and be with, with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with the coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved prove it and David said unto Saul I cannot go with these for I have no proof in them and David put them off of him so we see that Saul you know being a king he's trying to arm David he's trying to put David armor because back in those times you know people had helmets and shields and swords so Saul saw that David was very determined to fight the the, the Goliath um do you guys have, have an idea where you know we were talking, right? So, um, so, so Saul, his normal thing to do was to arm him with armor, you know. So I'm all like, well, he's gonna go fight the Goliath, so I'm gonna go fight the giant. So I'm gonna go and arm him with my tools, Saul's tools, not with God's. Even though he was all like, you know, maybe there's more that meets the eye. With this kid or with, with 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 this team, we don't know, but I assume he was young. So I'm gonna help him. I'm gonna help him. And Saul would try to help him by giving him armor. The problem was that he didn't know how to use it. Maybe like you know, it maybe it didn't fit him right. It was too big, too heavy. <clears throat> the thing is that it was not gonna help him. It was actually gonna make him slower. Maybe actually make him much more difficult for him to maneuver. So David says that he had no use because he, he didn't even know how to use them. He says right here. 
And David put them all, uh, and, and, and it says right there in the verse 39, And I cannot go with these, says David, for I have not proven them. So he has not done anything, you know. How many of you guys have played soccer in school? Uh, a lot of you guys. How many of you guys have played baseball? Yeah? All right. No? No baseball? No baseball? So how many? Okay, a perfect example. How many of you guys know how to swim? Raise your hands if you guys know how to swim. Okay, you know, four. Do you know how to swim? No, no, no. You know how to swim? No. So you see, not everybody knows how to swim. How would you feel if the entire group, you know, okay, so in 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 school, well, I remember when we went, we used to go to the to the to the to the pools right here. There is a there is a sport called uh, um, uh, uh, water polo. I think it's called water polo, right? So water polo, I played it. It's really fun. So water polo, it's almost kind of like playing uh, basketball in the water kind of thing, you know. There's hoops on the on the on, on the on the pool, and and you have like a ball, and you gotta you know go through the through the water and and throw the ball in the little hoop, kind of like basketball, but you're in the water. Now, how many of you guys that don't know how to swim, or how many of you guys have played that game? No, you guys really, know? yeah, it's it's not very common. Well. How will you feel if out of nowhere the coach tells you, you know, like Chalino, este Nazareno, you say you play soccer, right? Yeah. Well, what are you better at, soccer or, or football? Soccer, right? So you feel that if I give you cleats and shorts and a soccer ball, do you feel that you're good? You'll be good at it. Yeah, yeah, because you know what to do. You know what you got to do. You got to take the ball to the to the court. So, but what if I give you a, a, a Nazareno, here's a, a you know, a, a, a polo ball, and I give you some shorts. You, you said you know how to swim, right? No. You don't know how to swim? Oh, I thought you said you know how to swim. Oh, be honest, Dad. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, okay, even more, even much more better of a point. So, you said that you don't know how to swim. So, that means that if you don't know how to swim, okay. So, if I give you the ball and I give you the shorts, and then I give you some of them wear these funny little headbands. I know it's kind of funny. They wear them. You see them all in a little. And and oh, and I give you some goggles. Some goggles. They, they do wear goggles. And I'm all like, here you go, Nazareno. Go play uh, polo. What are you gonna do? I can't. I don't know what to do. And then I'm like, but the tools are here. Look, there's the goggles. There is the ball. Like, how hard could it be? Go 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 play. You play soccer. Go play. You'll be like, no. Hey, it's a ball. It's the same as a soccer ball. Will you play? No. Yeah, you see, you, you, because you, you you don't know. You see, but then that's the thing. You know, David, he 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 saw how the soldiers fought. He saw how they were fighting. He saw the armor, but he didn't know how to use it. So there was not going to be no, no use for him. So Saul so will try to help him out. Be like, oh, but here's the tools. Go do what, what you say you're going to do. And as you can see, he kind of tried them on, but it failed because he couldn't use it. He had no no... No, no use of it. He, he could. Everybody volleyball, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's an example, right? So not not all of us, you know, like me, I don't like baseball, and I kind of have an idea, you know, it's not that hard to play, but it's not really my thing, you know. But it's the same thing when when you don't know what what you're gonna go, and when somebody tells you to do something or or a job or a, or play something, and you don't know, and even if they try to give you the tools, you're still not gonna help you out. So Saul. Saul so tried to give David the tools, you know, help him out. But as you can see, it was not going to help him. So we're going to continue reading. <clears throat> and he took his staff, he took his staff in his hand and chose choose him five smooth stones out of, out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, he had even in a script. 
and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So as you can see, David was getting his tools that he know, his staff, you know, shepherds have staffs. He got his little sling, you know, his little sling. We were talking about the sling. And and we were um, we were um, we were talking about how you know he, he didn't know how to use a sword or and stuff. So what he did, he went to to get what he knows, stones. He went to get smooth stones, stones that that he could use for his advantage. And the Philistine came and, and drew near near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked upon and saw David, he disdained him, for he was. But a, a youth and a rudy and a fair contents, and, a, and of a fair contents. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou come with me with, sta with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So, as we can see, Goliath, the giant, got offended that David came with his tools, with his sling and his rocks. Goliath was expecting somebody of his own demeanor. You know what demeanor means? Demeanor. Kind of looks the same, kind of the same demeanor. So, he, you know, David was, was uh, Goliath was expecting somebody of his own lookalike kind of thing. Armor, shield, sword. But as you can see, David came with, with a stick and a, his staff and his stones. So he got offended by that. He's all like, come on, like, are you going to throw rocks at me? So... He, he got angry and he says that he cursed David with his gods. It means that he must have told him bad words or stuff in his own language. He was so upset. So we're going to continue reading. And the Philistine came on near unto David and the man that bare the shield. Okay, we're talking about right there. And the Philistine said unto David, Come, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the earth and to the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comes with me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come in thee in the name of the Lord, host, the God of the armies of Israel, who thou hast defied. So David is already saying, you know, you come with me with all your tools and your weapons. But even David doesn't even say, I'll come with my tools. But he said he comes with what? In the name of the Lord. So that's a very good point right there because as you can see, David is not relying on his tools as much as, 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 as Goliath. And yes, like, like I was talking about last, last week when, 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 when I was preaching here and I told some of the adults because I preached last, last Sunday and I told them that David, why he pick up five stones? He could have just picked up one if he had so much faith. But I was, I was telling them that David didn't want it to test God, saying, hey, you know what, yeah, God could be, but I'm not going to test them. And so, you know, I'm like, you know what, maybe I'm still going to get five. You know, I don't know why he chose maybe there's some number, symbolic number to it. But he was not over, over, um, overconfident by, by saying, you know what, no matter what happens, I'm going to go fight the Goliath. Because if he was defined like that, he could have just been like, you know what? I don't even need a sling. I don't need nothing. I'm just going to go there and, and something is going to happen from this guy. But he didn't. He used a tool. But as we can see and we're reading, he doesn't mention that. He just says that I come in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel. You know? And he says, but you come in with your weapons and stuff. We're going to continue reading. <clears throat> And and they and said, um, this is this day will the Lord deliver thee in forty six, verse forty six. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hands, and I will smite thy, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the earth and unto the wild beast of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So God, so David is already telling Goliath, hey, this is what I'm going to do to you. Because you have defined, you have disrespected, you know, my God, my people, and me. So now this is what I'm going to do to you. So he's using fire against fire. But David is using spiritual fire because he's saying, hey, you're not just attacking me. You're attacking my God. Spirit, you know, you're already, you're, you're about to get it. And in 47, in all this assemb uh, assembly shall I know that the Lord 
Sabbath not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. You see? And this is, a, this is what I was telling you guys about two verses um, ago. That, you know, he's coming with his weapons, but he's coming with God. And he says right here. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with the sword and the spear. Means that the saved means that the God so it means that the guard means that God it's not gonna rely on weapons of men to deliver his judgment, his you know, his uh you can say his uh his power, you know, but he's coming with his power, but it, but he's using his spiritual more than that, more than weapons made by men. And it came to pass that when the Philistine arose and came and drew the night to meet David, and that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took then a stone and slang it. He slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead, that, he, the, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. What does that mean? He's, the stone sunk into his forehead. So, let's, let's pretend this is his forehead, right? Yeah. So the, the rock hit, and look what happened. <laughs> it, it went inside. So it broke his skull. So I was telling the, the, the adults um, last week that there's many theories. You know, like we were just talking about, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen movies, right? So... I, I was telling them that that the Goliath, you know, from his own view, because, you know, I was thinking, you know, from his own perspective, uh, from his viewpoint, was that maybe Goliath saw him and he took away his helmet. He's like, you know what? What is this kid going to do to me? And because it says that he hit him in the forehead, if he took his helmet, it means that the, the rock hit him straight in the, in, in the head and cracked it and sunk in. Or... He had his helmet on, and the force from that rock was so strong and so powerful that he even broke part of the helmet and it sunk into his head. So there's two theories, you know. But most, most, most uh, like movies that I've seen and and, and 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 scholars think that that Goliath must have taken his helmet off because he was acting overconfident. He's like, ah, what is this gonna do to me? And that was his downfall too, you know, over overconfidence. But we all know that it wasn't God's plan. But you know. For David to hit him right in the forehead and do that damage, he must have really slinged that thing hard. So he he got he got he got killed immediately. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran. And stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheet, therefore, and slew him and cut off his head. Therewith, and, and when the Philistines saw their champion dead, they fled. So David had so much anger and so much uh, uh, fury and so... Uh, there's, a, there's an expression called uh, battle, uh, battle hardy. Me that he was so into the, the moment that after he hit him with the rock, he went to his body and he took away his own sword. And with his, with his own sword, he, he, cut, it, he, cut, he cut him uh, his head off. And so I don't know if he was still alive when he hit him with the rock. Maybe he was choking. We don't know. But it's just, it makes me think how much of, of a fury of... of uh, of uh, you can say trying to do God's vengeance on earth, you can say that way. So how much David's fury on that moment was he that he hesitated for no reason that he went to the to the giant and cut him like down like so fast. So it makes me think that you know David was like you know what this person deserves nothing but God's judgment, and it's and it, and all and this and in this story that we're reading. Later on, it tells us why he acted in many different ways the rest of his life. The rest of his life, he did a lot of things that we're, I'm, I'm amazed. I, um, I, I try to think like this man had such a, a, 
a battle, a, a warrior's mind, that he he showed mercy to some of his enemies, and yet to some of his enemies he did not completely destroy them. So, anyway, so let's finish, keep reading, finishing the, the chapter. And when the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistine until thou come to the, to the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and, they, and, and the wounded of the Philistine fell down by the way of Sharim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put it in the armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as, the, as thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, and inquire, thou, inquire thou whose son of this strimpling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said unto him, Whose son of art thou a young man? And David answered, I am the son of the servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So that concludes the chapter 17 that we will read you. So Saul, as you can see, what was the reaction that the Philistines got their, you know, they got their, um, you can say they, they, they lost a big battle that, that day. They fled. They got scared. They got, they, they were so, um, they were, you can say they had their faith in that, in that giant so much that at the end it didn't help them. You know, at the end they, they put their faith on him so much that when he failed, they had no other choice but to run away. And it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, you know, I have, um, I've studied many, many wars, many uh, history, many uh, generals from the past. A lot of books I've read, and it's really rare for an army to flee when a single person dies, and that's happened a couple of times in the history, and it has brought big consequences in the battle. But most of the battles, sometimes the 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 warrior, the king falls, and either the armies continue fighting stronger or they flee, you know, and and a lot of the mistakes that a lot of generals and and soldiers made in the past was that they rely so much on one person. And when that person failed, everybody fails. It was, it was like a, a reaction. And that, and that sometimes is not a good thing. Because if you're relying on somebody, you know, you say you play soccer, right, Nazareno? So what position do you play, do you know? Oh, football, okay, perfect. But what position do you play in football? Okay, yeah. Um, do you know who, I'm pretty sure you know, you know who are the best players by now, right? Yeah. You know who are the ones that, hey, you know what? So, for example, is, is like the quarterback a perfect example, you know, because we're, we're, try, we're trying to relate, you know. So, Nazareno knows who, which are the good players. So, if they're going to go play an, another school, another team, and the quarterback doesn't show up, he got injured, let's say, let's say they're playing and, they're, and, and, and it's a really tough game. And if, you're, if your quarterback gets injured, how do you feel? Do you feel like, oh, are we going to win or are we going to lose now? If it's kind of evenly? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you see, perfect. So he there. So he what, what he's trying. What he, what he's saying is that he there's gonna be now doubt in his mind and on his team that you know what maybe we're gonna win with, with the quarterback, but now that he got injured, you know what? Uh, maybe maybe not. You know, and the whole team feels it. When I was when when I was young, I used to play soccer too, and and I know that I know we had good teams and we had good players, and when one of them didn't show up, I know that. 
a change in the mood of the kid. Even we were like 13, 12 years old, and, and we felt like, oh, man, we may lose this game. And then when I was goalie, I feel like the whole pressure was on me because now I have to play harder because now I don't want them to score because oh, they're going to try to score against me because we, we don't have our best players. So I feel like there was more pressure on me. So as you can see, when, 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 um, when we rely on other people and those people fail and then you fail, it's not a good, it's not a good feeling. That's why this gives us a perfect example not to rely on somebody a lot. And, 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 and sports is just one thing. You know, sports, we have, you know, it's, it's a fun game. It's, it's, but when we're talking about life situations, sometimes we, we are, you know, we find ourselves in situations where we got to rely on people and then they don't fall through. And then, you know, you, you, you fail in your task or whatever. So sometimes it's always, that's why it's always good to rely on God first than anything else. And that's a perfect example. So these Philistines, they relied so much on Goliath that when he, when he died, when he got killed, they fled. They got scared and they fled and they lost that big battle that day. And they were, and you know, later on in the history, they were able to recover. But that, that day is marked even after what? More than almost 2,500 years, you can say, or more. And we still remember the story from, from then, from their failures, we still remember their story, you know. And the Philistines, they don't exist anymore, but it makes me think if they were still alive, they'll always be ashamed <laughs> because of this battle, you know. But anyways, but as you can see, um, Saul was so impressed by David and his action that he was asking, hey, who's the, fa who's the father, who's the father, who's the father of, of this kid, pretty much what he's saying and, and he's asking his generals, he's all like, bring me the, the father so I can, you know, see where he's come from. And then David goes and tells him that he's Jesse from, from the servant of, uh, of uh, from the Bethle Bethlehemites. So, uh, and that, that's, another, that's another important thing because, um, you know, where, where was Jesus born? Do you know the city? Do you know the city where Jesus was born? No, 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 the, the city, the city that, that Jesus was born. Come on, it's very simple. Which one? Yeah, Bethlehem. That's why they say, you know, Jesus, you know, is the son of what? You know, that's why, that's why Bethlehem is, a, it's, it's very, um, well, it's, it, it's called a Bethlehem, it says right here, but it's from, the, he comes from the city of Bethlehem, and that's where Jesus came, you know, in the small city of Bethlehem. That's why they used to say the 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 the, the son of uh, uh, this expression King David. The okay, well, that's another story. But later on, um, you you know Joseph and Mary, right? Joseph and Mary, yeah. So Joseph, if you guys didn't know, Joseph comes is a descendant from David. So David's dad, you know. From until Jesus was born, uh, Joseph is, is, is part of his descendant. That's why they call him, you know, the son of David, because he comes from the, the, the lineage from David. So um, it's, it's very, it's, it's another, I don't want to get into that thing, uh, that too much. But it's just a little, a little, a little interesting thing that, you know, that's when Bethlehem is it's, it's first put on the map. Well, you guys know that when you Bethlehem. So, you know, going back to, to what I was saying. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have to rely on God on our on our daily lives and don't rely on people and on our own tools sometimes if always rely on God first and then whatever tools he gives us that will be enough all right so I'm going to give you guys to go to Ephesians and I'm going to give you guys a little a little example of the tools that we can have because you're like well what tools can we have well there's many tools so, and this is a perfect Ephesians chapter 6. And it's going to be verse 10. Uh, are you guys ready? All right. 
So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And I'm going to read unto the 18. So if you guys can follow. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of the might of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wild the willis of the devil. For the, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses, wickedness in his high in high places. Whoever take on uh, unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil days, in the evil day, and having done all to stand, and stand therefore, having your loins girt upon with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shirt with the prepar the preparations of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where where with you ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the word of God, praying always with all prayers, supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all preferences and, uh, and the supplication with all saints. With all saints. So, in this chapter we're reading, it's giving you guys an example. What kind of armor should we have? David, his armor made by man was unable to fit him. And as you can see, it was not going to do good to him as we were just reading, right? So now, two, almost, almost 2,000 years later, Paul is saying, yes, we all need armor as Christians against this world because we're not fighting against one person we're fighting against many principles and evil spirits in this world it's not just one giant we're fighting against millions and millions of giants then now we need more of god's armor in our lives so paul says hey yes you guys can wear armor but you can wear armor in the spiritual way and what is that spiritual armor we were just reading it reading the armor that we need and as we can see in chapter 10, it says right there, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of the might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. So, as you can see, we're not fighting against Goliath anymore. We're fighting against the devil and, and his dark minions and everything that he stands for. So we, we need to be even more prepared for what it comes, you know. And, and that's, and that's the, the point that I was trying to get to you guys the entire time since we've been reading this. That, you know, back in those years, you can say people rely on, on, on man-made objects like, you know, this. Swords and weapons and stuff. But now as Christians, we need something even more powerful than that. Something that, you know, that is not only going to try to kill our flesh is trying to kill our spiritual soul. And that's their goal. And that's even more important than anything is your, is your salvation, is your soul. So for that, you need spiritual armor. You can't have man-made armor. It does, it does no good to you, you know. And this, and this world that we live in, with all the weakness that goes around, physical armor doesn't, is not going to do good to you. There's nothing good that's really going to do. What you need is spiritual armor. Because that's what's going to make you overcome anything in this world. Do you guys are following me along? Yeah. So that's a good. So that's that's why I wanted to give you guys this verse. Because as you can see, in that moment, David, of course, he could use spiritual armor. But in that moment, David needed, you know, his the full power of God in his life. First of all, to not to be fearless. And. To have the strength, of course, physically to to do to get a sling and everything, to overcome his challenges, but and we, and you can say every single one of us are Davids in our own way. We're all Davids, you know. We all, you know, some of us are smaller than others, bigger than others. But I feel like in in this world, you know, I feel like most of us are usually, you know, are overmatched most of the time. You know, we're we're always overmatched by the enemy, by the world, by all the wickedness that goes along. You know, even the most spiritual person. Compared to how wicked the world is and everything going on, it's it's you're, that's not gonna stand. 
most of the time we're always on a disadvantage. But as long as we have God with us, we're always going to be in the, an advantage. But from our own personal life and our personal uh, ways, we're not going to get that far because we can. It, the, the world is too, too powerful, too strong for us, and it's going to destroy us. That's why it's always good to overcome anything in our lives with God's armor. And then right there, Nazareno, if you can read right there in, um, uh, where is it? There? Right there in verse 13. It says right there. You can stand up too if you want, man. And then what says 14? And then 15? So as you can see, he's reading every single part of armor that we all need. You know, he's saying the, you know, the breastplate, your, uh, the, um, the, the, the loins from your grade, every, um, and then it says right there, the, your feet, feet armor. And then if we, if we're reading in chapter 16, it says, take up your shield. You know, so you could so you can defend yourself against whatever is being thrown at you. So all that is it's really it's it, it's giving you guys uh, how to overcome everything. And then the thing is, and and anything in, in any game, like like uh, Nazareno was saying, you know, he plays football. In any game, and in any war, there is always you always have to have good defense, but also good offense. So. Good defense is good to have it, but if you don't have good offense, you're not gonna you're not gonna win. You can't win just with defense, because you have to have an offense too, you know. In soccer, it's good that you can stop the ball, but if you're not making points, <laughs> you're not gonna win, you know. So, it, the Bible is giving us yes to give us the armor, but also the most important thing too, you gotta have a weapon. And what weapon does it give us? Right here in the where it says right there and uh oh and then it says right there and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god what's those what's the most powerful thing that we have in our arsenal of weapons the word of god the bible that's your most powerful weapon that you have in this world to overcome any challenges and anything in your life so you know, it's good to have armor. It's good to have everything. But also you got to be able to fight off your enemies, fight them off from you, you know, and take charge when you have to. So it's good to um, to be able to withstand anything that the enemy may throw at you, but also be able to fight off the enemy when he's trying to attack you. And that's the thing. And that's what God gives us. He doesn't just give us shields and helmets and, and breastplates, but he also gives us weapons, you know. And what's, more, the, what's the most powerful weapon that we have? His word. This is the most powerful weapon that we have. So, and that's the thing that is going to keep us from achieving our goal, which is our goal is to overcome anything in our lives, in this, in this life, in this world. So when we die, we go to God's presence. If not, if he comes, then he'll take us with him. Amen. So do you guys have any questions? Questions, questions, questions. Nazareno, any questions? No. Benji, any questions? No. Pretty, you you understand it? Yeah. <laughs> Ruth, no questions? No. It's good. Do you guys have any questions? Um, oh. oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Oh, you see? Yeah. You know, and, and I didn't talk to him about this. This was, uh, I was just telling him, because I just, asked, I just uh, told him briefly what, what I talked to uh, the last week. When, when everybody was in Utah, to the adults here. And I just told them a little bit from what I was telling you guys in the, in the, other, uh, uh, the other week. So um, I don't know, maybe he got <laughs> exploration from that <laughs> or something. But, uh, but it's good. It's good. Um, it's good because, um, um, you know, um, like, uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, kids are still growing up and, and they're being... Um, indoctrinated by by a lot of things that you guys you know you, you guys a lot of you guys have no idea how much 
change has happened through all the years when I was you guys' age, you know? Things are so complicated now. But um, I, I was talking to, uh, to a guy that I work about um, oh, knowing our enemy and, and knowing how to overcome it. But but he was going, he was saying that, you know, or like, oh, well, I should, should I start reading the devil's Bible? <laughs> and I'm all like, no, man, that's not the way, you know. So I was trying to explain to him, you know, how can you spiritual. He's like, oh, but it's because I thought that's the way we can know our enemy. I'm all like, no, well, that's not the way. That's the way you can end up losing against the enemy. He's all like, well, it's okay. I was, I was trying to see where they're coming from. I'm all like, well, man, that's, well, I mean, yeah. You can see where they're coming from, but the thing is that that kind of stuff is, if, I mean, I, even I, I told him, even I, I wouldn't say that I'm so spiritually that I'll be able to overcome whatever that thing is. Because when you're reading or you're looking into that stuff, you're opening your 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 spirit to anything that, that's coming out of those books because you're reading them. And a lot of them have like um, seances. So you may be like, oh, and then and you're in your mind, you already are. So I shouldn't even be playing with that kind of stuff. He's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Like yeah, so just yes, it's right there. See, but don't don't but don't dive your mind into that. And then because I told him, then if it starts saying, even it may not even if it's, even if it starts um, explaining very philosophical, because he says there's a lot of philosophy, a lot of philosophical phil philosophies. You know, you may end up your mind getting lost in that. So yeah, and I saw I'm like oh, okay, so I told him you know what this is what you're supposed to be reading, and I gave him that chapter. But he he's, he's starting to to he he um he's trying to get more into it. But he has a Bible, but there's a lot of things he still needs to read. But but yeah, that's what I was telling you guys. So and that's and that's one of the things that I wanted to get you know with David is that um you know how we can use it in both ways. You know David used his weapons from his time and he was able to overcome his enemies. Now we as Davids in this life we need to overcome our own enemies and our own giants. And put on our armor and our weapons that has God gave us that are more powerful than, than you know, than David's. Now, we, we have spiritual, more powerful weapons than he has. So with that, we're going to be able to come anything in this life and, um, and succeed, you know, until God comes or, or we die. Amen. So, you know, keep praying for, for your parents, for one another, you know. I don't know how this school year is, but, you know, every I feel like every school year... It's crazy. One of my friend's uh, sister, she works in the solo that school, and she says that every year it's it's a headache, more of a headache. So many changes, so I can only assume what, what changes you guys are going through. But at least you guys have the spiritual armor. Amen? All right. Yeah, you guys can stand up, and we'll, we'll pray. Okay. God, I thank you for today's sermon. I thank you that you've given us, you know, alignment in your in your word and your Bible. I pray that you gave you go. Yeah, I pray that you give these um, these youth knowledge in your word and help them in their school and their daily lives, that they be able to overcome anything in their lives that it's struggling them and their mind and their soul and their heart, that they be able to overcome any 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 anything that the enemy may throw at them. You know, I I pray for their parents too to give them the strength. And keep, you know, giving them the courage to follow your path. Give me and my other brothers the strength, too, to keep reading to your word and to overcome anything that the enemy may want to, you know, take away from your own path, your path of life. I pray, Lord, that, you know, use every single one of these youth and your word and keep giving them that thirst of knowledge from your word and keep giving them, you know, the the armor and the weapons the, the, your word so they could overcome anything and withstand anything that the enemy may throw at, at them i pray in your holy name lord jesus christ amen amen so thank you guys for coming hopefully that helps you and that concludes with david and goliath maybe later on we'll, we'll